Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Steve Lund, and in this video, we're going to talk about sauna. We're going to talk about all things sauna. What is the sauna? What are the benefits? How do you do the sauna? And uh, those kind of things. It will be a full guide to taking the sauna, basically. Make sure you click a like and subscribe as well for future videos about optimizing your health and performance. Do it! All right, so let's start with the absolute basics. What is the sauna? Uh, essentially, the sauna is this small room that you heat up with uh, firewood usually traditional sauna and uh, yeah you elevate the temperature of that room and you sit there <laughs> usually if you're like in estonia or finland or russia then you're probably there naked as well and the um, yeah it's a very traditional let's say form of uh, self-cleaning it's uh, one of the traditional places where people would uh, clean themselves like in um, in ancient times or in a few even a few uh, century ago People would be born in a sauna and they would also be uh, basically washed, their last washing uh, before they're buried was also in the sauna. So it's this kind of almost like a sacred place in these uh, Nordic uh, cultures because of the way it, you know, keeps you clean. And it also has a lot of health benefits, which we will talk about uh, shortly. What happens in the sauna? Well, uh, I'm going to reference to many other studies here. And uh, this image is from uh, actually a very new uh, 2021 October uh, study or uh, more like a review by Rhonda Patrick actually, uh, sauna use as a lifestyle practice to extend health span. And uh, what the sauna essentially does is that uh, it elevates your core temperature. And of course it induces sweating as a result of that. But this elevation of core temperature um, also has other effects like increases your heart rate. It uh, helps with uh, blood redistribution, causes this small amount of heat stress that uh, actually has a beneficial effect on the heart and stroke volume and blood pressure, all those kinds of things. Many other health benefits from this small amount of uh, thermal stress that you experience. The normal human body temperature is around 36 to 37 degrees uh, Celsius. And this is the homeostasis, essentially, where your body is functioning the best at, and it takes least energy and least effort to stay uh, you know, healthy and functional. If you drop below that, you start to experience hypothermia, which eventually can lead to death. Uh, whereas if you exceed that, then this condition is called hyperthermia or a fever, basically. This uh, fever, you know, is obviously can also be lethal in uh, excess, uh, but it also has uh, some uh, good health benefits. What essentially happens is that uh, when you're in the sauna, you experience hyperthermia, you cause a small fever, and the fever evolutionarily has been um, one, of the, um, one of the most common and one of the best let's say, immune responses to any kinds of infections and uh, diseases. So if you are getting sick with some sort of a pathogen, then the fever is a very natural and a healthy response uh, to that. Because with a higher body temperature, you uh, do see some immune system boosting benefits and you can also potentially kill off these uh, pathogens with the heat. So the fever is very uh, evolutionarily viable. And even like suppressing fever with these anti-fever medications, uh, then uh, can be actually damaging and can, can be actually lethal in some cases. So the fever is very healthy uh, in moderation. Excess fever obviously can lead to death, but uh, a small fever for an infection and for uh, the immune system is beneficial. And the sauna uh, mimics that with, you know, the hypothermia has other benefits, which we'll talk about, but the fever aspect is uh, one of them. The heat that you do experience from hypothermia follows this uh, hormetic uh, bell curve that uh, describes the small amount of toxin or stress that has a beneficial effect on the body. And in small amounts, in moderate amounts, it has a positive effect, which is great. It increases resilience and increases other health parameters. Whereas if it's in excess, then it's eventually going to have diminishing returns, which will be harmful. And uh, yeah, too much in excess will actually be uh, damaging. And the same applies to everything like exercise, sauna, cold, fasting. They all have this uh, hormetic uh, bell curve. In small amounts, it's great in excess is harmful. So what does the sauna do? I'm gonna reference back from the uh, Rhonda Patrick paper. So heat stress, it uh, has been associated with many health benefits, like it reduces the incidence of cardiovascular disease, reduces muscle atrophy or uh, muscle loss, it uh, reduces the risk of neurodegeneration and increases health span, which describes this um, functional fitness and functional health span or functional, you know, being youthful and being healthier for longer. The sauna, because it increases your core temperature, increases your heart rate, increases sweating, increases blood flow, all those things, it is considered like an exercise mimetic. And uh, exercise, obviously, is very known to be healthy for us. And the sauna puts you into a similar physiological state that your body thinks that it's almost exercising. You, uh, when you sit in the sauna, then you s notice your heartbeat uh, racing a little bit. You're getting slightly tired. 
uh, but not overly exhausted. It's not like sprinting. It's not sprinting. It's more of like a real brisk, brisk hiking. And uh, a lot of those benefits are mediated by this uh, hyperthermia, increase the core temperature and increased heart rate. From a vascular side, it improves vascular compliance, improves endothelial function, improves the blood flow, uh, can be beneficial for potentially clearing out the plaque with because of that, and uh, also blood pressure in improves. Um, although your like heart rate increases in the sauna after you come out, your uh, let's say basal resting uh, blood pressure would uh, generally get better as a result of that because of this small exercise. Uh, exercise improves blood pressure and uh, the regular sauna use as well. Although, like, if you have already hypertension and high blood pressure, then you may want to be more cautious uh, with the sauna and exercise as well. You don't want to be doing some crazy heat. You don't want to be raising your body temperature and blood pressure too much if you already have high blood pressure. But in, uh, for healthy people, it's actually one of the best things uh, for prevention, preventing against the hypertension. And lastly, what also happens with the sauna is the activation of these uh, heat shock proteins. And uh, these heat shock proteins are essentially molecules that have many benefits. So one of them being uh, preventing protein aggregation, repairing different kinds of uh, damaged molecules, and uh, being like almost antioxidant, not antioxidant, but uh, they do repair uh, these um, dysfunctional cell parts and uh, eliminate any potential inflammatory molecules that also may sp spread around. Heat shock proteins. So uh, from the same paper, what do heat shock proteins do? Uh, heat shock proteins have been found to be uh, very beneficial for just general longevity and anti-aging and the main reasons for that has to do with um, repairing misfolded proteins and uh, preventing protein aggregation like i said these kind of damaged molecules and the research does find that the heat shock proteins different kinds of them have a protective effect against uh, neurodegeneration heart failure cardiomyopathy atherosclerosis and even it's going to slow down muscular atrophy so um, they reduce a muscle break breakdown which is beneficial for you know, bodybuilding, but especially longevity as well. What the heat shock proteins do is that they uh, repair misfolded proteins and uh, as a result of that your uh, body will experience less damage and less inflammation and uh, will be healthier. The heat shock proteins also uh, promote autophagy, which uh, will additionally help to clear out different kinds of you know, um, inflammatory molecules weak and broken cell parts, all those things that cause uh, oxidative stress inside the body, those will be removed with the help of autophagy and uh, the heat shock proteins. Let's move on to some of the benefits of the sauna. Uh, so uh, obviously, or probably the biggest, uh, or the biggest effect of the sauna is associated with heart health. And uh, it is pretty uh, well researched that the sauna reduces uh, heart disease mortality and the risk of heart disease quite a lot. So this study from Finland 2018 saw that the uh, people who took the sauna more than four times a week had a 63% reduced risk of uh, heart disease mortality and a 40% reduced risk of all-cause mortality compared to those who did it only once a week. So the blue line is once a week, green line is the uh, more than four times a week. Two to three times is still better than once. Uh, but more than four times is, you know, <laughs> even greater, even much a huge, much bigger um, decrease in the risk. And obviously, this is only once a week. Once, even once a week is beneficial compared to no times at all. So imagine what would the risk be uh, in people who don't do the sauna at all. And uh, yeah, it, it seems that you know the more you do the sauna, then the healthier it is. Almost um, doing it every day is uh, is fine actually. So I don't think that it's going to be harmful for you. Um, you may want may not want to do the day yeah, like you may want to do it like every other day optimally, but yeah, as this study shows, that even like four times more than four times a week is still um, beneficial. Like you can still see some hormetic benefit from doing it more than four times a week, and that doesn't appear to be a point of diminishing returns uh, from this uh, frequency yet. The reasons why uh, the sauna improves uh, cardiovascular disease uh, is multifold. One of them is actually yeah the heat shock proteins themselves. Uh, heat shock proteins increase nitric oxide, which uh, increases vasodilation, and uh, this is beneficial for atherosclerosis and uh, just you know blood vessel health, and um, that will that itself will be very uh, beneficial for reducing the risk. Then there's also the uh, nitric oxide that increases angiogenesis, which angiogenesis is the process of growing new blood vessels. So uh, obviously you want to have <laughs> your uh, 
your uh, muscles and uh, organs well supplied with uh, enough blood and uh, with inadequate angiogenesis or without adequate uh, blood vessel formation you know the obvious the, the risk of strokes and uh, thrombosis and those kind of things uh, would be higher H hif1 alpha is a hypoxia inducible factor one alpha and uh, that is also uh, apparently well you do experience some aspects of hypoxia during exercise and uh, the sauna mimics some aspects of exercise so the uh, hypoxia increases VEGF, which is a vascular endothelial growth factor, which also it grows uh, new uh, blood vessels. So we have more blood vessels, the blood vessels are going to be healthier, more blood flow, um, inc improved blood flow uh, from that. And in the brain, the uh, nitric oxide also um, basically reduces sympathetic nervous system uh, activity. So it kind of calms you down, uh, reduces the pressure or reduces the stress on the heart and actually makes you a bit more um, you know, parasympathetic. It's a really good way to relieve stress actually although you know doing the sauna session itself you do put yourself into a slight elevated state of uh, sympathetic overdrive because it still is like a form of exercise but after the sauna you come down from it and it's actually very uh, parasympathetic for heart disease avoiding obesity and avoiding insulin resistance is also very important because metabolic syndrome uh, diabetes they increase your cardiovascular disease risk a lot and the sauna is also actually been found to uh, reduce both the you know, heart disease but as well um, have some protective effects against metabolic syndrome diabetes and uh, obesity so um, the heat shock proteins what they do is they uh, do increase insulin signaling they make you more insulin sensitive and they improve the glucose uptake into the cells which is uh, good you don't want to have you don't want to be insulin resistant and you, want, you don't want to have high blood sugar levels either so the uh, sauna actually helps to lower your blood sugar uh, by doing that the second biggest benefit from uh, the sauna use is uh, with uh, neurodegeneration. So there are a lot of studies that find how uh, heat therapy can be beneficial for protecting against uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, cognitive decline and any kind of neurodegeneration. And uh, the way or the reasons for that are again multifold. Obviously metabolic health is a part of that. The, the uh, heat shock proteins are important for that, uh, removing these uh, aggregates in the brain. Uh, but you know cerebral blood flow is also important so getting adequate intake of uh, nutrients and the blood into the brain will be you know obviously important for maintaining brain health and uh, preventing neurodegeneration one like hidden uh, let's say benefit of that would be also the muscle function so uh, having more muscle having more strength uh, although it's like a you know considered to be a physical trait it's still very important for the brain as well because with more muscle you have better metabolic health you will uh, probably have better blood flow as well and uh, strength training itself also has benefits uh, on the uh, brain and uh, heat therapy it has been found to be actually a positive thing uh, for muscle hypertrophy and muscle strength it improves muscle mass it improves uh, recovery from exercise and improves your uh, metabolic health in, in total this study again from finland uh, 2017 found that uh, the men who used the sauna four to seven times per week had a 66% lower risk of dementia and a 65% lower risk of Alzheimer's compared to men who used the sauna only once a week. <laughs> so that's another huge uh, reduction in the risk of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's in those who did it more than four times a week. So again, it seems that uh, doing the sauna as, as frequent as possible, preferably every day, is kind of the go-to uh, recommendation if you want to fully reach the optimal um, reduction in uh, these disease factors and uh, yeah it's a pretty uh, huge difference again obviously i don't think that you need to do the four times a week if you're already healthy uh, but you know if you have the possibility then doing it in some you know at least three to four times a week uh, would be kind of every other day can be like a good uh, strategy to do psychotic disorders so uh, this study found that uh, sauna four to seven times a week Re resulted in a 77% reduced risk of psychotic disorders. <laughs> so kind of similar graph, blue line once a week, green line four to seven times a week, and you, you can see 77% reduction in psychotic disorders. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you want to maintain sanity, you want to be not, you want to go insane, then uh, yeah, the sauna can be again beneficial for that. And again, the reason has to do with maybe a reduced inflammation, uh, reduce me improved uh, metabolic health, reduce these protein aggregates and those kind of things. So four to seven times a week repeatedly <laughs> appears to be kind of the good optimal amount or the frequency that you want to aim for when it comes to the sauna. Let's talk about the immune system, uh, respiratory diseases, influenza, the common cold, pneumonia, those things um, that have been found to be uh, beneficial 
uh, with sauna. So uh, sauna two to three times per week has been found to reduce the risk of pneumonia 27% compared to sauna one times per week or not at all. And uh, the sauna four to seven times per week was 41% lower risk of pneumonia compared to sauna only one times per week. So again, the four to seven times a week uh, outperforms the sauna two to three times a week. Um, the two to three times a week is still obviously better than once a week or no, no sauna at all. But yeah, four to seven times a week, yeah, <laughs> will always uh, yield greater uh, results as it seems to be. So yeah, some sort of hypothermia may be uh, quite important to do daily. You want to elevate your body temperature in some shape or form every day. It doesn't have to be exercise or it doesn't have to be sauna. Uh, it can also be exercise. So uh, you can mimic the sauna with exercise and you can mimic exercise with sauna. <laughs> so uh, any kind of elevating your body temperature, any kind of hypothermia, acute hypothermia, at least once a day is a good idea for all these disease uh, parameters, the heart disease, respiratory diseases, uh, Alzheimer's and other things. Let's talk about working out. So uh, I briefly mentioned that it helps with the muscle hypertrophy, which is true, uh, but it also improves just overall endurance and fitness. In this study, the participants uh, did a 30-minute sauna session two times per week after a workout. And uh, by the end of the study, they show that uh, they had a 32% improved uh, run time to exhaustion, which is quite uh, phenomenal. It's a really good result. And uh, yeah, the sauna is good for post-workout recovery, but it also has enhancing the effect on actual the adaptations that you experience uh, from the uh, workout. Growth hormone. Uh, so uh, the sauna increases growth hormone. Uh, in these studies, these two studies, they have been found that the uh, two 20-minute sauna sessions at 80 degrees Celsius separated by a 30-minute cooling period can raise growth hormone by twofold. Two 15-minute sauna sessions at 100 degrees Celsius dry heat separated by a 30-minute cooling period increase growth hormone fivefold. Two one-hour sauna sessions a day at 80 degrees Celsius dry heat for seven days was shown to boost growth hormone by 16-fold on the third day. Uh, so yeah... With the uh, heat, it also appears that slightly uh, more frequent bouts and higher temperatures tend to increase more growth hormone. And uh, probably because of the similar reasons that it mimics exercise and has these other hormonal effects. Obviously, growth hormone isn't, you know, it's not anabolic. It's not going to make you build muscle. But uh, having some elevations in growth hormone may be beneficial for like some additional fat loss. It may help with uh, muscle preservation, anti-aging effects and uh, maybe bone health. So, uh, yeah, you don't want to be, you know, deficient in growth hormone, at, the, at least especially when you're getting older. Muscle loss, so the heat shock proteins, they uh, do repair these protein aggregates, but they also reduce protein breakdown. And the growth hormone contributes to that. The growth hormone is anti-catabolic to a certain extent. And it has been found in studies that uh, the sauna use uh, heat treatment reduces uh, muscle atrophy. So local heat treatment reduced skeletal muscle atrophy by 37% compared to placebo. In this study, they actually immobilized the people. They uh, caused them an injury and uh, the uh, two hours a day of uh, heating versus the uh, sham or the placebo, they, no, no, no uh, heat treatment group. They saw that the uh, heat, heat group saw a 37% uh, reduced uh, muscle skeletal atrophy which is, uh, you know, important. For many things, it's going to be important for uh, cancer cachexia, sarcopenia, aging, and those kind of things. Uh, but if you're interested in bodybuilding, then uh, that's also something that you may want to consider, that if you want to reduce your muscle catabolism, then exposing yourself to some heat uh, can be a good thing. Fibromyalgia, uh, or like, you know, muscle soreness, chronic fatigue, those things can also be improved with the sauna use, as it uh, turns out to be. And in this study, they particularly... The, uh, the functional discharge capacity was uh, much higher in the group who uh, got exposed to hyperthermia or basically the sauna or some heat therapy and their discharge was um, looks like it's like 15% higher or something like that compared to uh, no uh, heat exposure. So yeah, you know, <laughs> if you don't want to be in, in pain, if you don't want to be sore all the time, then yeah, maybe you want to expose yourself to some sauna. And from your own experience, I can tell that, yeah, it's really good for just achy joints, any kind of uh, muscle soreness and those kind of things, especially if you combine it with the cold. You do the sauna, you jump into the cold and you can almost like instantly lose any kind of uh, soreness or like aching, achiness. Depression. So uh, the heat hypothermia also apparently uh, reduces uh, the depression scores. In this study, uh, effect of whole body hypothermia versus sham treatment 
on 17 item Hamilton depression rating scale across the six week post intervention period. And as you can see, the white dots is the uh, sauna or the hypothermia group and their depression scores were much lower than the ones who received the sham treatment. Although both apparently saw some sort of uh, a reduction, um, the sham didn't get the hypothermia, but the maybe the combination of the sauna with the traditional uh, depression treatments uh, would yield a bit uh, greater reductions in depression scores. But it does appear to plateau around like uh, week two. Uh, so yeah, you may want to, you know, still want to do it regularly, but you don't, may not see like additional benefit after week two or week four. Let's talk about the detoxification. So sauna is uh, actually very good for detoxification because of the sweating aspect. Sweating is uh, essentially the main mechanism through which we detoxify uh, things um, from our bodies. Those can include uh, heavy metals, different kinds of plastics, uh, chemicals, yeah, those kind of things. And uh, there are a lot of studies that find that uh, the, uh, the, it is possible to sweat out those toxins and uh, metals from your sweat. And the sweat is uh, a bigger excretor of these uh, compounds than uh, urine, for example. So the concentrations of these metals and uh, toxins is uh, greater in your sweat than in your urine. So uh, yeah, you do want to sweat <laughs> on a regular basis, uh, especially if you're exposed to some sort of um, toxins or heavy metals. This study, yeah, took the uh, actual comparison, blood, urine, and sweat study, mon monitoring and elimination of bioaccumulated toxic elements. So you can see the black one is the sweat, much greater excretion of these different kinds of uh, metals uh, than in the urine. So uh, yeah, you can't piss out the heavy metals, apparently you need to uh, sweat them out. Bisphenol A, BPA, and all these or organochlorine pesticides, herbicides, they're also uh, excreted through the sweat. All right, let's take a brief pause, <laughs> a brief break. I'll just uh, repeat, uh, give an overview about the health benefits of the sauna and the hormetic uh, kind of uh, bell curve. So what the sauna does, it reduces inflammation, which is good for body pain and reduces risk of dementia. It improves your insulin sensitivity, eliminates toxins, kills viruses and pathogens, increases growth hormone, the ble better blood flow, reduces risk of heart disease and the heat of proteins will uh, conduct esophagy, DNA repair and glutathione, which is the antioxidant, master antioxidant in the body. So those are the benefits. Some potential negative side effects or the potential harm you may get from the heat or the sauna include uh, dehydration, losing electrolytes, losing minerals, heat exhaustion, like you could pass out in the sauna, you could die to that, so it's no joke. Um, arrhythmias, if you have pre-existing cardiovascular complications or pre-existing uh, high blood pressure, then you may want, you have to be more careful with the heat and you may experience arrhythmias more easily, uh, but the arrhythmias may also occur if you're healthy because of being uh, deficient in certain uh, electrolytes and minerals. So if you become deficient in, let's say, sodium, magnesium and calcium, sorry, calcium, yeah, but, potassium and then uh, you may also get arrhythmias although you have no actual cardiovascular disease strokes obviously if you have again cardiovascular disease and burn injuries so getting burned either by touching the stove or something like that or if it's like super high temperature like 120 degrees celsius then you may also get burned on your skin another potential side effects of uh, excess heat especially around the testicles is uh, suppression of uh, spermatogenesis. So uh, too much heat, especially around the testicles, will shut down uh, the um, production of sperm and it may uh, reduce sperm count if you're doing it chronically. So if you are doing the sauna four to seven times a week, <laughs> then uh, you may want to um, prevent against, uh, against that. And one easy way to do that would be to just use an ice pack. So this is like a really trendy thing, uh, uh, at least among my followers and um, some other people like um, Lucas Owen from uh, Australia who kind of popularized this would be to yeah, use some sort of an ice pack on the testicles, either in the sauna or afterwards. I like to do it like afterwards, like um, I'm not using it in the sauna, but after the sauna, I usually use the ice pack maybe five to 10 minutes, something like that. And uh, that will resume the normal um, spermatogenesis process. There may be some um, considerations when it comes to like pregnant women or uh, very young children. So uh, 
yeah, I wouldn't say that a pregnant woman should go like some really hot sauna <laughs> and uh, ramp up the heat to 100 degrees Celsius or something. Um, but the uh, there are studies that find that the use of like 70 to 100 degrees Celsius for 10 to 30 minutes doesn't really have like any um, negative effects on things like birth defects or uh, other, other complications. And the Finland, where most people do the sauna all the time, they actually have the uh, lowest rates of anencephaly, anencephaly, which is some sort of a birth defect um, in the world. So uh, yeah, although they do take the sauna, even pregnant women probably all the time, they don't appear to have these birth de defects. So you don't have to worry about it, but still, you know, be a bit more cautious, you know, don't exceed maybe 80 degrees Celsius, 70 to 80 degrees Celsius for a pregnant woman is, uh, I think, good enough. And it may actually improve the health of the child as well by, you know, causing some heat shock protein response and obviously keeping the uh, mother also healthier. There is a threshold that where, where it becomes uh, dangerous and uh, the th threshold appears to be around 38.9 degrees uh, Celsius. So if your uh, the mother's uh, body core temperature raises basically to 39 degrees Celsius, then uh, that is going to be uh, problematic. So you want to keep your uh, body temperature lower than uh, 39 degrees Celsius when you're pregnant. And uh, yeah, you don't want to be doing too much heat, basically. All right, so let's look at the timeline of the sauna. Like when do certain things happen? When do those benefits uh, come? Obviously, you can't sit in the sauna for two minutes and get all the benefits. You need to sit there for a little bit. Uh, so, initially, you know, when you start to sweat, then you will see already some excretion of these toxins and heavy metals. Um, because, uh, yeah, you don't need to be sweating profusely <laughs> to achieve that effect. Any kind of sweating can uh, do that. And usually, if you sit in the sauna for at least like, 5 to 10 minutes, then you, you start to see some uh, more sweat uh, coming. And the same applies to the heart rate. You will see, like, a slight increase in your heart rate already within, like, t 3 minutes. Uh, but it uh, does start to ramp up uh, significantly at 10 minutes or so 15 minutes this uh, will be uh, like increased white blood cells uh, which is beneficial for the immune system and uh, eliminating infections so yeah that is a good thing uh, you do can also see this increase in growth hormone uh, up to fivefold based upon the study that i mentioned earlier all these other things all these other time points are also based on studies <laughs> so i'm not, not making them up they're all based on the studies that i've already mentioned and the other references that we use in our books like uh, the immunity fix with uh, dr james and my own book uh, stronger by stress so yeah this is an actual timeline <laughs> not something that i make up um yeah growth hormone increases fivefold around 50 minutes cardiovascular benefits you can start to see around 20 minutes so you're you know, the same to like exercise. If you're just exercising for five minutes, then you may not see the cardiovascular benefits, but this 20 minutes of moderate elevation in your heart rate will uh, provide additional these heart benefits and the cardiovascular benefits that you start to see. Heat shock proteins uh, kick in at 20 to 30 minutes. So yeah, you do need to experience some aspects of this heat stress and uh, elevated temperature to start to see the heat shocks, heat shock proteins. Uh, you can see the heat shock proteins if you just sit there for two minutes, you do need to sit there for at least 20 minutes to start to see the heat shock protein response. And the heat shock proteins then repair damaged molecules and misfold proteins. 30 minutes, your blood sugar will start to drop uh, because of uh, this improved insulin sensitivity that happens. You increase GLUT4, which is one of the uh, glucose transporters. That increases around 30 minutes and that also shuttles the uh, glucose into the cells, which will uh, result in uh, lower blood sugar levels. You could get it a bit faster, maybe 20 minutes if it's the temperature is uh, higher. Uh, but yeah, the optimal amount of the uh, sauna length would be 20 to 30 minutes in one sitting that you do. Uh, you can't dissect it, <laughs> like you can't do 10 minutes of sitting in a sauna, then going out 10 minutes again and then reaching 30 minutes. Maybe you will experience some, uh, but ideally you would want to sit there at least 20 minutes in one go and really, really ramp up this uh, heat shock protein response and really ramp up the GLUT4 activation and uh, get all the cardiovascular benefits. So yeah, at minimum you want to get uh, 20 minutes in one sitting, then go out, maybe take a slight cold shower, an ice bath or something, and then go back in for maybe like 15 minutes or something. Mm. 30 plus minutes, you will start to see this uh, dehydration because of losing water and uh, minerals. Um, that can be prevented if you consume electrolytes, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, like the longer you stay there without drinking any water, then uh, you could pass out from that. So you have to be careful with that. Some people are more uh, vulnerable to that 
um, especially if, you, if they go hypoglycemic as well. If they've been uh, fasting while going to the sauna, then their blood sugar levels may be already slightly lower and they may get hypoglycemia and they may pass out much faster compared to someone who uh, has taken their electrolytes, has drunk water and um, is also having uh, normal blood sugar levels. 60 minutes, you will see this uh, huge increase in growth hormone 60-fold. Um, uh, but you don't need to do that. Like, see, I don't know. I wouldn't say that a 16-fold growth hormone increase is better than a 5-fold growth hormone increase. <laughs> There's no studies that compare it. And, you know, with growth hormone, more isn't always better. And you don't, it's not like this huge miracle hormone that you need to have a 100-fold <laughs> to see some health benefits. Like, probably a 5-fold uh, growth hormone increase itself is already uh, pretty good. 60-plus minutes when you're over an hour, then you will start to, yeah, see a great loss of minerals especially salt, uh, sodium, and the risk of heat shock may also go up. The risk of heat shock can be easily uh, reduced and prevented if you cool down in between the sessions. Let's say you do 30 minutes of the sauna, you take an ice bath for like two minutes, you go back in, then you can, you've completely like mitigated the risk of heat shock because you cool down your body. But if you stay in the sauna for 60 plus minutes in one go, <laughs> not going out at all, just sitting in there, throwing in the, uh, the leil, the lulu, then uh, yeah, your risk of heat shock can be uh, quite high and you can, you're going to pass out. People have died from the sauna, like in the World, world uh, Sauna Championships. The, uh, one of the finalists died from uh, heat shock or, and the excess heat. So. But you, regular, regular people don't usually die <laughs> unless they're super pushing the temperatures. So this study from uh, the Rhonda Patrick paper shows that uh, the uh, heat shock protein response peaks at 30 minutes and it starts to drop after, after that. So you don't need to be doing it longer than uh, 30 minutes to optimize the uh, heat shock protein response. And the temperature for that appears to be 70 degrees Celsius or 163 degrees Fahrenheit for the optimal uh, heat shock protein response. And the heat shock protein response rises 150% or 50% uh, above a baseline. And uh, in uh, people who are uh, acclimated, they're acclimated to the heat, then they actually see a greater increase, the a greater concentration of the heat shock proteins, uh, up to over 200%, almost like 250% which is 150% uh, above a baseline, whereas the non-acclimated individuals tend to see a bit less of this uh, heat protein response, which goes to, show that, goes to show that actually you're not going to see a point of diminishing returns even if you do the sauna more often and more frequently. So it appears that you still get heat proteins even if you are super acclimated to the heat, and it appears to be that you get even more <laughs> of this heat protein response, especially if you are used to the heat and especially if you have been acc acclimated uh, to is a heat exposure. From a duration perspective, then there's also been studies comparing the duration of a single sauna session. So the same authors from Finland, Laukenen, 2015, uh, they found that uh, the compared with men having a sauna bathing session of less than 11 minutes, the adjusted hazard ratio for sauna bathing sessions of 11 to 19 minutes for sessions lasting uh, more than 90 minutes there was a, a significantly lower all-cause mortality and a significantly um, reduced uh, risk of uh, fatal cardiovascular events. So uh, yeah, 11 minutes is worse than 19 minutes, so to say. So 19 minutes uh, tends to be better than 11 minutes when it comes to the duration. And uh, like I said, I think the 30 minutes is probably kind of the optimal amount. So yeah, short sauna sessions, they may be reducing the risk a little bit, uh, but the optimal risk reduction is around 19 minutes and uh, beyond that, 30 minutes probably, if you want to get the heat shock protein response as well. And the temperatures, I think, uh, are again usually around like 70 to 80 degrees Celsius uh, with these uh, Finnish studies. Usually that's kind of the uh, minimal where you want to uh, go into sauna, 70 degrees Celsius with the uh, traditional sauna. Another break, <laughs> let's do another pause, a brief overview of what is going on. Uh, we have the sauna, Chichit which we've made Instagram post with Dr. James. What are the main benefits of the sauna? So it increases insulin sensitivity, it improves your brain health, reduces neurodegeneration, improves immunity, detoxifies you and has heart health benefits. The optimal temperature based upon the studies is around 156 to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which in Celsius is 70 to 100, 100 degrees Celsius, not 700. <laughs> so 100 degrees Celsius is kind of the good maximum amount. You don't need to go above that. You don't need to go 120. You're not going to see additional health benefits uh, from that. You're only going to get burned. <laughs> you may get burned and uh, 
you may uh, you like you could increase your physio physical uh, resilience against the heat, uh, but it's um, you know usually people don't need to do that. Usually they're gonna show off <laughs> if they want to go to 120 degrees uh, Celsius. Like I could sit there easily, but I don't think that it's healthy. Or it's, it could be healthy, but it's not like needed. You don't need to do that. The optimal length is uh, 20 to 30 minutes per session in one sitting. So to say, you sit there for actually 20 minutes. Um, in one sitting and the optimal frequency would be two to four times a week or above that and I personally do the sauna, you know, I try to do it every day So I would end up getting like five to six times a week uh, But I also also use the infrared sauna. I use the traditional sauna maybe once or twice a week um, And uh, yeah, but I still get like uh, four over four times of uh, heat exposure per uh, week Let's talk about the minerals that you do lose uh, from sweat from the book Mineral Fix, the references for this uh, graph with Dr. James. Uh, it's based upon uh, studies on uh, sweat in exercise, uh, one hour of exercise. Uh, but obviously sauna it mimics exercise. And I think that you actually sweat more <laughs> in the sauna than you do while exercising. And you, and so this graph would actually be even greater when, when we were to take it from the sauna. But regardless, what are the minerals that you lose in your sweat? So iron and calcium, you lose a little bit, very small amounts, like 0.16 to 0.63 milligrams of iron and 40 milligrams of calcium, which is a very small amount, uh, and it's nothing to really worry about. Like, you can get it from just, you know, eat, taking one bite of meat <laughs> or something like that. You'll get more than that fr from that. So you don't have to worry about iron and calcium when it comes to minerals from sweat. Selenium, 40 micrograms. Zinc, 0 0.4 milligrams, potassium, 140 milligrams, and magnesium, 8 to 10 milligrams. These are also fine. Like, the, these amounts are also pretty low. Like, 8 to 10 milligrams of magnesium is not that much. 0 0.4 milligrams of zinc is low. And, yeah, you don't, you don't necessarily have to replenish those minerals either. But, moving on with chromium, 7.5 micrograms, copper, 0 0.4 to 1.5 milligrams, and iodine, 52 micrograms. Uh, these are a bit more significant uh, losses. So the RDA for chromium is like 11 to 14 micrograms, so almost like a half of your daily chromium you can lose in one hour. Uh, copper also 0 0.4 to 1.5 milligrams. Your RDA for copper is like optimal intake of copper would be like 3 milligrams, so again like almost a half. And iodine 52 mili micrograms. Uh, the RDA for iodine is 100 to 150 micrograms, so again, almost like a half of your iodine. So yeah, these are the minerals that you do want to replenish. Um, chromium, copper and iodine, uh, especially after the sauna. With chromium, the easiest and most reliable way to get chromium is to take a chromium supplement. Like chromium picolinate um, helps with insulin and helps with diabetes as well. I do take for other purposes, I think it, there are studies that also find that it may help with like body composition and insulin sensitivity overall. Um, so I take a chromium picolinate, like 200 to 1000 micrograms uh, on the days that I do the sauna. Uh, this is not, you know, <laughs> that you have to do, uh, but that's what I do at, at least. Because the absorption of chromium from food is also pretty low, it's like 1%. So if you want to replenish 7.5 micrograms of chromium, with food, you have to consume maybe yeah, like a, a hundred micrograms of chromium, mm, or yeah, seventy micrograms of chromium, which is uh, unless you're eating mussels, unless you're eating like three ounces of mussels or three ounces of oysters, then it's hard to uh, achieve that. Copper, you could replenish that with just liver. Take one ounce of liver, <laughs> and you got it. Uh, iodine, fifty micrograms of iodine, you could get maybe from some fish and um, sea vegetables, those kind of things. You don't need to yeah, supplement iodine if you're eating uh, seafood, uh, but you may want to do that if you're not eating seafood. And lastly, salt is the biggest loss when it comes to the minerals, sodium and chloride. You lose a half teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise, and when it comes to the sauna, the 30 minutes, I, would, I think it would apply to 30 minute sauna session. So you would lose a half teaspoon of salt from a 30 minute sauna session. Um, to replenish that, you just you can salt your food or you can drink salted water, um, something like that, a half teaspoon is uh, very easy to uh, replenish. Let's talk about the difference between dry saunas and steam saunas. So, uh, you know, both of them cause hyperthermia, both of them have hyperthermic effects, they raise your core temperature. 
have these beneficial effects on um, just overall health and cardiovascular benefits. The difference, main difference is that the dry sauna tends to be hotter. It uh, goes up until 70 to 100 degrees Celsius, whereas the steam saunas stay around 30 to 50 percent, 30 to 50 uh, degrees Celsius. So it's much uh, lower in temperature, but the humidity is much higher in the steam sauna. The humidity is over 50% in the steam sauna, whereas in the dry sauna, it's 10 to 20%. And because of that, you subjectively feel that the steam sauna is hotter because of the humidity. And you think that it's hotter, <laughs> but it's actually lower temperature. Um, I think the maybe the health difference would be that in the dry sauna, you will experience more of the heat shock protein response because of the higher temperature. Uh, whereas in the steam sauna, you may, may be better for like detoxification, you sweat more and uh, maybe like more blood flow a little bit because of the uh, kind of sweating side. Mm. The difference would also be that in dry sauna, you can throw lulu or lail, <laughs> which is, describes this uh, taking the water with a cup and throwing it on the sauna stove, uh, which creates this vapor. Uh, it kind of resembles maybe like the steam sauna in some sense. Briefly, acutely, the lulu uh, will uh, raise the temperature it feels it's hotter because of the increased humidity, but it drops down afterwards. Uh, so it doesn't stay uh, constantly high temperature. Um, yeah, which one is better? Well, I do prefer the dry sauna because it's not as hot all the time as the steam sauna, uh, but obviously the steam sauna is also fine. So people always ask, like, can I, can I still get the benefits of the uh, sauna from the steam sauna or the steam rooms? And the answer is uh, yes, you probably can. Uh, I'm not sure exactly... Uh, what would be the timeline for the steam sauna, but I think it's kind of relatively the same. You just stay in a steam sauna for 20 to 30 minutes and uh, you'll be fine. What about the infrared sauna? So the uh, difference between the infrared sauna and the conventional traditional sauna is that the uh, infrared panels, infrared lights, they uh, heat your body from the inside out. So the infrared wavelengths penetrate your body deep, deeper and they start to emanate, start to heat your body from this way. Whereas in the traditional sauna, the stove emanates the heat and it heats up the air around you. So the air is then heating up your body, uh, which is kind of a different, it's more of like an outside in approach, whereas the infrared red is an inside out <laughs> uh, elevation of the temperature. Uh, but yeah, both are going to be uh, elevating your core temperature. Both will lead to hypothermia eventually. And uh, the difference is only that the uh, infrareds, they do penetrate deeper into the skin and, you know, they start to heat your body which will then also have like additional health benefits uh, such as collagen synthesis and some other skin benefits, maybe improves joints a bit better because it uh, goes directly into the joints, uh, lowers the inflammation there. Uh, so um, yeah, it does have a bit of more unique benefits. And the wavelengths themselves, infrared is around, you know, 700, 630 to 700 is the red light and uh, above 700 to 900 is kind of the infrared uh, wavelengths, nanometers. There are also studies about the benefits of infrared specifically, quite a lot of them. So uh, just a list of few far infrared sonars for treatment of cardiovascular risk factors, uh, way on therapy, which is um, sort of like using uh, like a sauna blanket or an infrared blanket in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. That has also been found to uh, improve uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, way on therapy improves quality of life as well as cardiac function and exercise capacity in patients with chronic heart failure. Uh, far infrared therapy inhibits vascular endothelial inflammation via the induction of heme oxygenase 1. So yeah, the infrared sauna also has cardiovascular benefits. It has other benefits. Uh, nerve repair. Then there's uh, phantom limb pain treated by far infrared rays. And uh, v improvement of vascular access blood flow and pain control in hemodialysis patients. So yeah, there's uh, similar benefits to the infrared as the uh, traditional sauna. But... The uh, infrared also, again, improves skin health a bit more than the traditional sauna. And this study found that the cellulite treatment can be, or cellulite treatment could uh, could be uh, used uh, with the infrared, which is uh, maybe some people are interested in that. For uh, anti-aging purposes, obviously, the infrared can be a bit uh, better because of that. Uh, wrinkles and skin, skin pigmentation, that works. So in this study, six weeks of uh, infrared treatment as you can see, like there is a small difference in the wrinkle um, density or wrinkle in intensity. Um, yeah. And I do notice like the, with the red light therapy as well as the infrared that it does have some skin benefits because of that. 
uh, strength training effects of far infrared sauna bathing on recovery from strength and endurance training sessions in men. Uh, Finnish study, if I'm not mistaken. In conclusion, a deep penetration of infrared heat, approximately 3 to 4 centimeters into fat tissue and neuromuscular system, with mild temperature, 35 to 50 degrees Celsius, and light humidity, 25 to 35 percent during far infrared sauna bathing, appears favorable for the neuromuscular system to recover from maximal endurance performance. Um, so yeah, it does help with the exercise recovery as well. Yet yeah, the infrared saunas have a bit lower temperature, um, which um, can be fine because you're still, um, you know, you're penetrating deeper into the system, so you're kind of getting access to some aspects of the body uh, without needing that much temperature. Maybe for the heat shock protein response, again, the traditional sauna can be better because of the higher temperature, uh, but you can... Um, effectively get some good heart heart benefit, heart, heart cardiovascular benefits uh, with also 50 degrees celsius by using the infrared um, sauna neurodegeneration the infrared sauna has also been found to benefit near infrared and the far infrared as well benefits uh, neurodegeneration so what the uh, near infrared light does is that uh, it you know, penetrates the brain, <laughs> penetrates the skull uh, deeper into tissue and helps with uh, ATP production, helps to repair mitochondria, causes these heat shock proteins there, causes autophagy there to a certain extent probably, repairs neurons, stimulates neurogenesis or uh, synaptogenesis, which uh, creates new connections. Um, and uh, there's also endothelial cells, which, um, you know, cells inside the endothelium improve blood flow, Vascul prevents vascular damage, repair vascular damage, repair neuronal damage, and uh, yeah, cerebral blood flow to the brain will be better as well. That is direct stimulation. Indirect stimulation also uh, has a benefit beneficial effect on the immune cells and the stem cells, Circu stimulates circulating immune and or bone marrow stem cells, and they swarm to site of damage through blood vessels and or lymphatics. So yeah, more delivery of nutrients into the brain, repair of damaged neurons, new connections and uh, neurogenesis so yeah using the infrared on the brain <laughs> in your head on your head is good for the brain as you can see what is the difference between uh, traditional saunas and infrared saunas the temperatures again are higher in the traditional sauna 70 to 100 degrees celsius whereas in the infrared my infrared is uh, 60 degrees maximum usually it stays around yeah 30 to 60 percent uh, in most cases uh, but I think that you may not need above that because of the infrared kind of penetrating deeper into the tissues. So yeah, surface heat on traditional saunas and infrared saunas, uh, deeper heat. You do sweat more in the traditional sauna, whereas you penetrate the joints with the infrared sauna, which I think would be better for arthritis as well as, you know, the brain, perhaps. Uh, things like uh, heart health could be a bit better uh, for that because of the penetration or like you know, arthritis and the joint pain. You heat up the sauna with the heat stove, whereas in the infrared, it's the infrared lights that are heating up your body. And in a traditional sauna, there's more humidity. In the infrared, less humidity. And because of that, the traditional sauna may feel a bit hotter, similar to the steam sauna. But both of them have similar health benefits. Both improve heart health, both improve blood flow, both make you excrete toxins, both kill infections, both support immunity, both uh, prevent uh, neurodegeneration. So yeah. You know, if I were to choose which one should I get only one, then I would personally, you know, I like the traditional sauna more. <laughs> I like it, but I would choose the infrared sauna uh, because of the, yeah, the penetration of the joints. And it's a bit easier to do it as well. You just plug it in and turn it on and you can get the uh, good temperature within like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Whereas with the traditional sauna, you have to actually heat up the sauna for at least an hour, <laughs> an hour and a half or something like that to get to the 100 degrees uh, Celsius amount. Uh, so yeah, if I were to choose only one, then I would choose the infrared sauna. But I have both, fortunately. Like, I have my own uh, traditional sauna, and I have, I have my own uh, infrared sauna as well. But <laughs> that's it for this video. A pretty long video. I think uh, I did cover basically everything uh, when it comes to taking a sauna. Uh, or kind of, at least the benefits, the main benefits. How does it work? And uh, how to do it, the optimal amounts. In conclusion, we can go back to the cheat sheet a little bit. Let's go back to the cheat sheet. Uh, main benefits, insensitivity, brain health, immunity, detox, heart health, and the optimal temperature, 70 to 100 degrees Celsius, and the optimal length, 
20 to 30 minutes two to four times a week you know obviously once a week is better than nothing <laughs> and even like once a month is better than nothing probably but the optimal maximum benefits you can see from f f more than four times a week so even doing it every day apparently is uh, healthy for you all right in conclusion the sauna is healthy for you <laughs> you should do it i think everyone can benefit uh, from it in some sense uh, and if you want to learn more about it then check out my books that i've written on this topic the immunity fix and stronger by stress other than that thanks for watching this video make sure you click a like subscribe notification bell as well my name is Seem. stay optimized stay empowered